Okay, uh, hello and welcome to another of our Rusty Talks podcast series that's, that is recorded in English. <laughs> um, uh, we have Eric here again. Welcome. Uh, well, welcome back. Uh, thank you for having me back. I'm finally not sick, so I can afford <laughs> to sound normal. Yeah. Yay. So we can talk about <clears throat> a lot of stuff. Yeah, I think we're just gonna, uh, it'll be, I guess, maybe similar to how the discussion went last time, but a little more free-flowing, just yep. as the topics come up, we'll... Yeah, because we, we we don't actually have anything planned. Nothing. <laughs> I don't know if we should, it's not a good poker hand to just show it in the first five minutes, but okay. I, no, I, I don't think, I think it's fine. That's no, fine. Because I think uh, whoever's tuning in should be in for, you know, just uh, conversation about film and I mean, the industry sure, and sure, the sure. movies. I, I mean, I definitely, to help you, to help promote you, I was marketing at least my podcast that I did with you or the mm-hmm. episode that I yeah. kind of showed up on. I was marketing it as it's good kind of thing to listen to in the background. You know, you can learn something new, but it's just so much talking about. You can just kind of figure figure different things. Yeah, it's going to be the same here, right? Like, I think so. Yeah, it's going to be here. So where, where, where do we start? <laughs> <clears throat> what do we want to start? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we actually did have a, a, a conversation just before starting. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, the, we're the, trying to find what to talk about. Yeah. And we ended up talking about so many different things. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, dude. I'm still coming at this from the the storytelling. Yeah. Let's let's uh, let's uh, start with know, that again, right? Yeah. So let's I mean, any, that, yeah. any any <clears throat> film, television, web series, what have you? It's all stories. Yeah. You know. It's an evolution from just verbal communication. Yep. Right. It's a just it's telling the same thing. Well, not the same thing, but it's telling something in a, just a different way. That's all. Um, so I mean, I think the issue we kind of face with film in particular is the direction you take stories. And uh, for me, in my personal interest, the question is, as a writer, how do you screenwrite? Yeah, the the big picture into something that is either a puzzle piece to a bigger picture or from page to page, scene to scene, line to line, actually smoothly progresses the ideas you're kind of getting at. And I think when you have these mega franchises that are all built upon themselves, that's one very kind of monolithic way of telling the story. But I think... The other thing is we shouldn't kind of forget our roots. And I think the cool thing about some films like uh, Harken Back, like Hot Fuzz, for example, yeah. Edgar Wright's film, <clears throat> is it takes the structure of one type of movie while injecting it with the life of a different type of film. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, with It does that at all. Oh, yeah. Right? That, that was just his, it. that was the marquee of his like 2000s, 2010s, you know? Um, I think we shouldn't forget the structure of the story and that's, you know, you have your acts, you have conflict, you have rising conflict, you have your climax, you have your resolution, right? And I think you shouldn't forget that within that you have the characters interacting with each other and it's through their interactions that this rise and fall occurs, right? And parallel to that, the characters change in many ways and sometimes not at all. And I think we're reaching this point in film where, Potentially, you we're getting more and more movies where they're not really focusing on that. It's like we have given you all these preceding films, we've given you all these preceding seasons yeah. of something. So the story is less about the characters and maybe more about the plot, or vice versa. Yeah. And I think, not to say that that's never happened before, but I think it's very kind of fascinating to see. Well, okay, there is so much more confidence in you deciding to make a movie this way, yeah, because you have so many characters that are established or characters that, you know, you're bringing from another property or whatever. I think that's very interesting too. Um, I just, I don't know as somebody who enjoys writing, it's just very fascinating because at the same time you want to encourage people to be creative, right. And and experiment, but at the same time you're going, well, you can't just experiment without understanding where you're coming from. You need to, at the very least in your career or the very least begin with the foundation or demonstrate that you have a thorough understanding of the the foundation yeah. before you start tearing it apart. Yeah, that's that's a very important thing that a lot of people seem to be missing or looking over. You know, you know, yeah. That that's a that's an important thing that we have to talk about. And then, uh, 
screen uh, screenwriting process and then the storytelling, right? Like you said, like uh, the, the core of this art is storytelling. But uh, they can be films that are, you know, style over substance. But um, like we talked about, um, what film was it? Um, uh, Roma, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The story isn't that uh, captivating or whatever, but the technical side of it, it's great. So um, let's talk about screenwriting. Um, what's your favorite screenwriter? Like uh, like these days, oh, like favorite screenwriter. That's yeah. hard. That's really hard. Um, okay, let's just say. <laughs> hold on. Yeah, okay. I have. Okay. I guess. I mean, uh, I know for anybody who tuned in for the last episode, I'm a huge Nolan fanboy. Except not really. I'm not a fanboy. I appreciate his work. <laughs> um, the work his brother Jonathan Nolan does is particularly impressive. Um, I, I mean, Indeed, again, it is, I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan of Quentin Tarantino, but I like him more so kind of the idea of him as just somebody who is his own man. He writes his own stories and he just makes them come to life. Yeah. Um, but I know there's a very classic example I love and, um, he, he's not a very prolific screenwriter, but I'm a huge fan of Robert Town, mm -hmm. Town, Town or Townsend. I think Townsend, Robert Townsend. And, um, he wrote Chinatown, okay. Roman Polanski's Chinatown with Jack Nicholson. And um, the beauty of that is that captures that kind of old-fashioned structure, but it really delves into the minute detail mm -hmm. of the characters. So there's a very famous example they give in certain film schools, like SC, I guess. I think SC does still do this in their lectures for screenwriting. But like his script in Chinatown gets into the detail of oh the client is the husband mm -hmm. the instigating uh of the plot instigator of the plot yeah. comes in and like he's worried about this stuff going on with his wife and he approaches jack torrance's character um no jack torrance is the shining sorry uh what's his name <laughs> uh, <laughs> chinatown come on uh I, I, jake, I honestly... jake okay um uh and uh he approaches jake and says like i'm really worried about this and uh jake kind of finds evidence that the husband's right mm -hmm. and the screenplay says almost verbatim that jake opens the the drawer where he keeps all his liquor mm -hmm. and he peruses through it he runs his hand over the different bottles and he's about to go for the really expensive stuff mm -hmm. but he both pities and doesn't want to waste the liquor on this poor crying mm -hmm. broken husband <laughs> so he moves his hand to the cheaper stuff mm -hmm. and then he pours him a glass and the screenplay breaks it down mm -hmm. in the film you see him do it yeah, Nicholson does it, and I think like that level of detail yeah. is just incredible. Mm -hmm. The like anything, the the problem there is you can so easily kind of fall into the pitfalls of having to give detail for every little thing. Yeah, and I think the problem there is if you have a screenplay or anything that an actor is going to read, not you. They're going. Yeah. Well, wait a minute, you have written everything for me to do. There's yeah. very little room for me to interpret it myself. Yeah. And so, I mean, that is a very real and justifiable problem. But I think the screenplay to Chinatown certainly works as a very compelling example of how you can do it in detail, but every line is effective. Because, again, I'm also firmly in the belief that every word and every line of dialogue needs to be there for a reason. If it's redundant in any way, try to find a way to remove it. Mm -hmm. So I think Woody Allen's still a good screenwriter. I know his the personal stuff makes it yeah. brings up a very interesting question about that debate of can you separate the man, the artist from yeah. the art? Um I think he still captures even to this day, he's kind of slowed down for a lot of various reasons. timely reasons, yes. Um but I think he still captures um a certain degree of the kind of romantic stigmas yeah. or the stigmas of life. Yeah, and simple stuff though. Yes, yeah. it's very simple. But I think he he's able to kind of maintain that degree of yeah. simplicity across like decades. Yeah, without really losing step. Mm -hmm. uh, some of his films maybe acted kind of poorly or maybe shot kind of less or so, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that it's a bad script. And I would say my last screenwriter that I do have an appreciation for would probably be Richard Linklater. Mm -hmm. Richard Linklater does a lot of his own writing, I know. Um, he experiments a lot with his film. He really yeah. does. Um, and uh, I think that's very compelling. I think yeah. he has a very prominent way of kind of telling the story with that bigger picture in mind, mm -hmm. the other way of looking at yeah. it, without it being like the level that, you know, say the major blockbusters that dominate yeah. the, the arena today yeah. are. Yeah. I mean, like the before trilogy. Yeah. 
Definitely, it was this experiment he had with uh, Ethan Hawke and Ethan Julie Hawk. Delpy. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, they were all in on it. They all yep. agreed. And so you have these established characters. And because of that, he could afford to move on into the next 10 years of their life yep. and focus on that development. And I think that's building on something without having to really re- spend the time rehashing who these characters are. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's very profound. Yeah. And I guess the last guy I would say... <laughs> Is a sort of cheap answer, but I really like James Gunn's style. Mm-hmm. I think he's certainly he and Edgar Wright, um, most apparently with uh, Wright's Baby Driver, very much capitalized on the incorporation of mixed media in the script. Yeah, I know. For example, the screenwriters I unfortunately forgot their names that wrote uh, A Quiet Place. Did a, I think Krasinski himself wrote it, right? He uh, he wrote a treatment of the story. Oh, okay. But the final screen. Writers, I think it was a, maybe him and another guy okay. or something like that. But the the script, I think, was a. It was some one guy wrote it, yeah. and then Krasinski might have changed it, but he had a partner writing part. Yeah, from uh, from what I've heard, the the basic idea of the story was put down before it was offered to him, and then he got on the story and he said uh, he would want to direct it, also change the screenplay a little bit, mm-hmm. and play the main character. Okay. Yeah, that's why he agreed to it. High that's demands. what I heard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but the beauty of that screenplay is um, it really messes with the technical formula of screenwriting. Yeah. Like, you read the pages, and, like, they really mess around with font and, like, margin yeah. placement. They really kind of experiment with that. Mm-hmm. And that's very sobering and refreshing for, like, anybody that's writing, and they're going, oh, my God, I have to write this way. It's like, well, yeah, you should. But there is place in the industry for people to really indulge that creativity in the structure of the actual physical screenplay. Yeah. Going back to James Gunn, and to a lesser extent, Edgar Wright, I mean, they're incorporating like specific songs yep. you know and i i into the script yes yes they're like so the uh james gunn i know with the guardians he, with the first guardians i don't know if he alone wrote the script but i know uh, it was he, 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 yes he yeah. had a writing partner and i know that james gunn was very gung-ho about it writing this song is going to play at this time yeah because it's going to reinforce the emotional beat at this scene yeah and i think that's very clever too Unfortunately, you look at what David Ayer did and you with Suicide Squad yeah. and you see the flip side of that. Now, I mean, yep. Suicide Squad is just fascinating because you can think about it as butchered on the operating table by the studio. Yep. Um, I think once upon a time, obviously, David Ayer is a little more mature than Josh Trank. He's not going to pull a, I had a suicidal vision. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of a great film. Unfortunately, you're never going to see it. He's not going to say anything like that. But I think the he was probably thinking of having the songs as it was kind of done in the film, be representative of each character. Tried to do that. But I think he was going to try to pace it out throughout the film Mm -hmm. instead of just front loading it all at the beginning of the film. Like the third, first 30 or so minutes. was Like, I mean, uh, you know, the first, the first sub act of the, Mm -hmm. you know, is just introducing to chief hopper, literally all, every member with, <laughs> accompanied by music. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, you know, they're with they're, the graphics and everything. They're promoting their urban outfitters, uh, forever 20, <laughs> well, forever 21 urban outfitters kind of clothes and all that shit. And it's like, it's, it's a mess because you don't get breathing room. Yeah. But if you introduce the characters that you need, maybe, you know, because she's popular, Harley Quinn or something, you start with her and then, you build up the team and as the story progresses and the, you give them these down moments mm-hmm. between the conflict and the action and they kind of talk to each other and learn yeah. about each other. Then you can cut to the next flashback and then you can kind of piece together from there instead yeah. of front loading it all in the beginning. But the other thing about Suicide Squad that makes it so interesting is that that film was like there were three edits of that film yeah. that we got, the theatrical cut. And the one that we ultimately got in theaters was done by the trailer house yep. that did the trailer for it, right? Yep. So, I mean, like, it's just everything about that film is just so exotic. Yep. But that screenplay, I think they maybe, I don't know if they actually wrote like this song will go with this character, that song will go with that character. But I think that definitely shows already a very risky downside to what James Gunn especially is capitalized mm-hmm. in Guardians of the Galaxy. And it's good to have him back. So yeah, it is, and he's doing Suicide Squad and Guardians. I know, 3. right? Speaking of the irony there, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, I think. Uh, I think it's going to be a challenge for him to dif- differentiate the films. 
in a way, because uh, obviously Warner Bros. hired him because of Guardians 1 and 2, right? The team of misfits and everything with the music and the characters and the story, you know. Well, it'd be nice because like James Gunn could then indulge in his more kind of gross, dark humor humor that he really exhibited when he worked with Troma and did Troma and Juliet. Um, I mean, you could get into some real creepy... I know Marvel literally calls it their Marvel Cosmic Universe or yeah. something like that. But I know like DC has some pretty freaky space stuff. I love mm-hmm. Starro, the mind-controlling starfish. They can <laughs> bring aliens into it. And then you could get some creepy imagery that's like Slither, his film yeah. Slither yeah. with Nathan Fillion. Um, <clears throat> Slither is good. And then obviously, you know, super. <laughs> yeah, obviously Super is, you know, the really that's the most apparent backdoor reason to get him in yeah. Guardians 1 in the first place. <laughs> But I mean, I think, yeah, DC, if unfortunately I, I kind of sigh because it's like <laughs> that tonal inconsistency yeah. there, there. I don't know how still I don't know if they're still gung ho about being dark and grim and greedy, like not greedy. I think greedy. Yes. But like kind of seedy. I think the way uh, the, the, the direction they're hitting is uh, too is like like the Joker movie. You know what I mean? Like Aquaman film like the and Shazam too, it's kind of connected to the universe that was set up by Zack Snyder with the, the you know Justice Leagues and everything, mm-hmm. but they're their own movie, right? Right. Uh, like I think they're distancing from, from themselves from that. I think Birds of Prey and The Suicide Squad. Now, these films are going to be their stand on their own. I don't think they're going to be connected to this universe. Well, I think yeah. I think that's an advantage sure. to the filmmakers, sure, sure. right? Sure. I think. Um, Definitely Suicide Squad has the luxury of that the comic book run from their publishing in the 60s, mm-hmm. I think, was when they were first introduced, or the 50s. The 80s iteration, mm-hmm. I think, has the most similarities to what we saw in the film. Mm-hmm. But, like, throughout the entire run, the Suicide Squad has had different members. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing is they can afford to, like, change, change their lineup yeah. yep. and have a different story. Yep. I think another thing I didn't, you know, get to tell you when I was going off on Batman Superman with Suicide Squad, the big problem there is, like, why is it a giant blue laser shooting into the sky? That's a trope I hate. We yeah, get into yeah, tropes if yeah. we wanted to. Yep. That's a trope that is overdone in superhero films. And Beam they, in the sky thing. Yeah. yeah. The, the Avengers the, did it. The alien laser. Yeah, but the, the Avengers should have been the last ones to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, <laughs> and, like, I am so sick of that shit. And here we are, 2016, Suicide Squad is doing it too. And it's like, you guys are late to the party. But... My problem is, what the fuck is Harley Quinn with a baseball bat going to do against an alien? You know, same question can be asked of Black Widow and Hawkeye. Yes, but but the entire team is not just consisting of like Black Widows and Hawkeyes. You have like a literal god of thunder. You have a guy who is literally impenetrable when he gets angry. Yeah, but at least I, 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 I says, at least Black Widow my, and my, my, are my assassins, point, right? My, yes, that's fair. Exactly. My point is with Suicide Squad, yeah. the plot could have been a little more grounded because obviously, right, I was telling you about with Storytelling 101 from uh, a la Eric, mm-hmm. you need to have a consistent logic of yeah. the world. So in this you consist- have to set that up first. The internal yeah. logic and mechan- uh, mechanics of that story Superman's dead, yeah. which again, I told you, I think is dumb that after two movies, you kill him off and then just go, whoops, no, we didn't yeah. tease that he's coming back. It's like, of course, he's coming back. Yeah. But obviously, the Suicide Squad movie we got is set with a dead Superman. Yeah. So what if the government sent the Suicide Squad to retrieve Superman's corpse? Yeah. Something a little more easier than a giant alien like ghost phantom, you know, yeah. shooting a blue laser into the sky. So it's like. You know, the government is basically saying we want to steal from ourselves. Yeah. And do with this as we please. Yeah. You know, like we're, we're going to use you guys and throw you under the bus, right? The yeah, plot. Yeah. So if you fail, you fail. But it's like that's that utilizes their skills yep. a little more intelligently mm-hmm. than having them whack like like goo monsters from like, you know, <laughs> uh, Resident Evil 7. Yeah. Like those black tar creatures. Yeah. Like they're like faceless. They're nameless. Yeah. You can kind of. If you have them be people, they're you just can, there for Will exactly. Smith to shoot. <laughs> exactly. So, like, you can utilize Will Smith. You can utilize like Boomerang a little more intelligently. Yeah. Like, there are things you can do if you have a more grounded plot. Yeah. I mean, Superman's still a supernatural being, but as we've established, he's dead. Yeah. So, if it's just to get his body from a heavily guarded facility yeah. 
then you can have you can drop some interesting characters. Yeah. Right. I yeah. think that would be kind of interesting, and I think that is where you should start. Yeah. And then you can get into the giant blue laser shooting into the sky, but don't actually do giant blue laser shooting into the sky. Doctor Strange did it really well. Yes, that Doctor Strange did. Um, and I think that was very intelligent, kind of because it was relevant to the plot. It showed to a degree the character learning. Yeah. As he went along, yeah. too. And that was very much not the best example, but compared to say Suicide Squad or definitely Man of Steel, it was a very clear, cut and dry, almost too cookie cutter Marvel esque way of having the hero earn his cape. Yep, yep. You know, th- to use another trope. Yep. And I think that is sure it's a safe, conventional way of telling a superhero story, but there's nothing wrong with that. If the hero doesn't earn their suit truly. Yep. Then they haven't earned it. You can't end the the film with them being like, "I'm a superhero now," which is Man of Steel. Which our version of Henry Cavill didn't. No, not well. He, he was never did. alive the first time, and then he or died. The second. And then he dies, being all moody and broody, but going, "Okay, I guess I'll be a superhero." And then he dies, and then he comes back and acts like everything that happened before didn't happen. Yeah. So it's an undeserving situation, yep. which. I can't believe I'm saying this, but to potentially defend Zack Snyder, <laughs> I think that the original idea of a Justice League where he comes back and he's kind of rogue would be kind of mm-hmm. cool. Mm. You know, I think the original cut of the film was going to have it end with him coming back. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, for whatever reason, I think the movie did it stupidly or didn't even talk about it, which is also stupid. Mm. But like, like they just explained that because he's dead. He just doesn't remember who he is. Yeah. But, I mean, I think the idea of him coming back and being kind of evil, like, that would be interesting. Because it would show, it would be an interesting way of testing yeah. th- the teamwork. Yeah. The whole point of Justice League as a team-up film is, in the case of Justice League, we're going to introduce everybody that yeah. you're not, you don't really know, except for Wonder Woman and Batman. We're going to introduce everybody, try to cram in their backstory in their life, and then have them all team up. Yeah. And it's like the idea is you'll have trial and error and they're going to learn from each other. They're going to grow. And eventually the final showdown, they're going to have to work together. They're going to work together and they're going to succeed. Yeah. They did it as a team. You know, whereas maybe whatever members like Aquaman would be like, I don't work in a team. Mm. Batman's like, oh, I don't work in a team. Yeah. Like whatever. But to have Superman be the guy that they have to work together and take down while killing him. Yeah. I think that would be kind of interesting. Yeah. Should have been interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it would have been cool. Like, would, and then you would have the cool-ass, uh, uh, um, the, re- the rebirth, rebirth of Superman, yeah. black suit, and he would have had the mullet. <laughs> I um, wish he, and, this, and the, and the, the mustache thing, I, I wish he kept the mustache. <laughs> no, because, did you see the, uh, the behind-the-scenes uh, leaked photo? Yes. The, with, with the mustache? Yes. With the pointy, you know, CGI thingy yes. on his face? He looks actually good. He actually looks good with the mustache in his Superman suit. <laughs> I wish he kept that. <laughs> I mean, it would be kind of neat if, like, they did. They just, you know, they tack a beard on him. And, like, his hair grows. Because he's, you know, he's Superman. He's yeah. been dead yeah. for God knows how long. Like, it'd be cool if he, you know, because he's Superman, he doesn't rot. Yeah. Like, his, he, his body continues to, like, yeah. you know, do the regeneration yeah. or whatever. And, like, he has a beard. Just tack and a beard hair. on him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's no problem with that. And Henry Cavill looks great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I tease him because in Man of Steel, when he wears the suit, Henry yeah. Cavill has a really hairy chest. Yeah. And the cut of the suit on his neckline yeah. is so low that some of the hair... <laughs> so I'm like, a, you know, it's like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I think, yeah, that would have been something worth doing. I um, I was telling you back way back when Man of Steel came out right before Batman Superman, before I realized how much of a dumpster fire that movie was going to be. <laughs> um, I did a rewrite of Man of Steel in mm-hmm. anticipation for Batman Superman. And one thing I didn't tell you when I was telling you about this rewrite was the idea of earning the suit. Right? Yeah. To go back to that trope. Like, the military in Man of Steel doesn't know what to make of him. Yeah. And I was like, well, let's be really on the nose with it and mm-hmm. have them look the same. Okay. So the idea would be that the uh, atmosphere... Mm-hmm. Right is what changes the color of the suit. So on Krypton, the Kryptonian in the beginning, that which was way too long a sequence, mm-hmm. in that Krypton sequence, there everybody's wearing gray. Yeah, it's like all muted and black. Yeah. And on Earth, yeah, it becomes red and yellow and blue and okay. all those colors. So when Zod and all those guys come to Earth, 
It's kind of a mix. It, it's red, yellow, yeah. and all of that. Yeah. So military is going, who do we trust? Yeah. So it's just shoot everybody. Uh-huh. And then, you know, something happens in that fight between Superman and the, the Zod soldiers in Smallville. And yeah. he saves everybody or something. Yeah. Something happens. Some test has to yeah. happen where Superman stumbles, but he certainly proves to the military, I'm on your side. Yeah. So then they go, oh, okay, we don't shoot him. We shoot yeah. them. And then we can keep that, the terraforming thing, as dense and stupid as that was, we can keep that. And then when Zod and he are fighting and they're getting sucked in or whatever, that's how I wrote it, that they're getting potentially sucked into the Phantom Zone, mm-hmm. that it's Krypton, Kryptonian mm-hmm. atmosphere. So Superman's yeah. colors get all yeah. muted too. And it's like that idea of literally visually showing he has to choose between Earth and Krypton. Oh, and Krypton, yeah. You know? So it's like that, I, the idea there could work. And it, it goes hand in hand with the idea of visual storytelling. It goes hand in hand with the idea of earning the suit because he ultimately chooses to save, stay with Earth. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, it's, I just, the idea there would be, like, don't kill Zod. Yeah. Again, it's, maybe somebody would counter and say, well, it's too much like Richard Donner's version. Mm-hmm. But it's like, well, don't have him snap his neck either. Yeah. Like, again, I think Zack Snyder just, he doesn't think about the repercussions. Or if he does, he doesn't think it through enough. I mean, I read it like a Vanity Fair article that made him look so unflattering. Like, he seems like <laughs> such an asshole bro. Like, he has like a bench press in his office. Yeah. And he just like lifts weights. <laughs> he seems like such like a, like a D-bag. And, like, you, you know, the, the, and it's like, you know, I say this, but it's like when the guy talks, he doesn't help himself either. He really yeah. doesn't sound intelligent. He sounds like a man who wants to sound intelligent. He's doubling, tripling down on his uh, well, you know, now vision. He is. But I think, you know, like, you know, I just... Like, I want to like you, Zack Snyder. Really? No, I mean, this is from the heart. Like, I want to like you, but you're not helping yourself. Yep. You're saying too much. You're trying to say more than you need to. And as a result, like, what? <laughs> like, you just come across, like, really weird. Like, he has, like, a skull or something on his desk, too. Like, he's just a bizarre guy. And that's nothing wrong with that. You can be a bizarre guy. Speaking of bizarre. Yeah. yeah. Instead of Doomsday, have Bizarro. I wrote I did a <laughs> Facebook post right before Justice League came out in uh, 2017. I was like doing a countdown. So the week before Justice League came out, my first post was instead of Biz- Doomsday, have Bizarro. Mm-hmm. And don't kill him either. Keep him. Mm-hmm. And then we could have a movie about planet Bizarro mm-hmm. where Bizarro's world is all upside down. And yeah. He lives with Bizarro people yeah. and Bizarro things. And like yeah. something happens and he gets angry and he's sent to Earth. And like we have to calm him down. Like yeah. it kind of works that way. But it'd be very cool. Again, visual storytelling. Yeah. You have Superman who's fucked up in the past. He's kind of trying to redeem himself. So what better than to have this antagonist be a literal and himself. antithetical opposite of him? Yeah. And he has to overcome that. Yeah. And it works because he can tie in Lex Luthor. Because Lex Luthor in most of the comic book iterations and in the, you know, equally phenomenal cartoon Superman the Animated Series. Yeah. Um Lex Luthor creates Bizarro. Yeah. He, he creates a clone of Superman that is just corrodes and becomes imperfect. Yeah. And that's Bizarro. And I think that would be really cool. Yeah. It would be very on the nose. It'd be very basic, but it would work. I don't so, think Jesse Eisenberg and the rest of the cast were in the same movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 like, I, when you isolated, I, I liked Jesse Eisenberg's uh, performance. When you isolate it from the other characters, the movie he's in. But when you take it into account the whole film, it just it didn't make sense. I think, honestly, if you're going to, okay, uh, to play script doctor here with, again, 2024 uh, uh, post-sight vision, uh, Lex Luthor's personality should have inverted. He mm-hmm. should have started off not, well, okay, in my, as growing up with the show, my ideal Lex Luthor is the Clancy Brown voiced. Yeah. Uh, Lex Luthor, who's cold, steely, kind of Calculating. Cruel. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, that's what I would refer to. And again, uh, I was telling you about my my lifeblood, my Catwoman scripts, yeah, which yeah. are like the pride of my like hobby writing, uh-huh. screenwriting as a hobby. Um, that like keeping the characters kind of related to or in homage to the cartoons that the yeah. kids from the 90s grew yeah. up with. There's no harm in doing that because yeah. we're all like 20s, 30s. Yeah. We're the people seeing the movie. So yeah. if we go, oh, my God, that's the character that was from the cartoon. Yeah. Oh, my God, that character is just like the char- this version of the character from yeah. the show. Like, they're not going to get angry. You're not yeah. alienating the comic book fans yeah. because the cartoon fans and the comic book fans have a degree of overlap. Yeah. So uh, there's something wrong with having 
uh, Eisenberg's Lex Luthor start cold and calculating, yeah. and then just as the film progresses, and then definitely after he, oh god, if he interacts with Steppenwolf, like starts losing his yeah. mind, yeah. then becomes a kind of loony, kind of antsy yeah. Lex Luthor. And then, you know, because God knows we've had in the cartoon Justice League, which was incredible in its yeah. own right, we've had episodes where Luther's gone insane, where yeah. Luther's like reformed and changed yeah. his personality. Yeah, he did. And some, either it's a ruse or he's being controlled or he snaps out yeah. of it. Like something happens. Like you can, you know, you can experiment. Yeah, you can play and with that. And if people yeah. are like, why is Lex Luthor like that? Isn't that the <laughs> hashtag not my Lex Luthor? Yeah. You can change him back and yeah. have him. But like everybody knows Lex Luthor as this kind of, cold calculating exactly yeah. he's very brilliant that way yeah. that's how he and clark kent are supposed to be the like antithetical foils to yeah. each other like that's the whole point and yeah. i feel like the film kind of missed that and i think the idea of him questioning like gods and all of that stuff is yeah. interesting and it boasts some very heady concepts but the execution was so poor yeah i still don't know why he feels that way yeah it's one thing if he says Alexander Luther Sr. beat yeah. the shit out of me as a kid. Yeah. And we lived in a religious household. Yeah. And I he made me pray. Yeah. And even when he beat me, I prayed to God that it would stop. Mm. And no God ever came. Yeah. And now I'm an adult. And my father's dead. And, and there's, there's a, a superman. And there's a literal superhuman yeah. God. Yeah. Where the hell were you then? Yeah. Then that would be like, okay, it's yeah. not the most intelligent and like concrete, but I can understand that motivation. We but, didn't, I think they teased it, but it's like, don't tease I, that shit. I didn't, um, um, I'm not sure if I, I didn't know or this, okay, here, here it is. Alexander Luther, right? Uh, Luther. Jesse Eisenberg's Luther. Uh-huh. He's at Lex Luther Jr. Alexander Luther. Yes, Jr. Lex. Lex has always been the, the junior. He's always. Also, uh, he's son. always been the junior. Yeah. The character yes. we know is yes. always been. Has always oh, been okay. the son. Yeah. Okay, because, because, because I didn't know that. I mean, I knew Lex Luther, but I didn't know he was the junior all the time. All this time, the comic versions and the animation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. So. My idea of uh, Jesse Eisenberg Luther was that he was son of uh, the Lex Luthor we oh, knew. Oh no no no! The the son of Lex Luthor that we know has historically always been a good guy. So I thought I thought that would have been an interesting thing. Yeah. Like maybe I, I don't know have Brian Cranston in the sequel as hey, as the cool. actual Lex Luthor we know. The Jesse Eisenberg that, right? is the son of him. Uh, like you know that's what I would have. No, I, idea I think was. I think a lot of people wanted um, Brian Cranston. I know like because you know, <laughs> when the casting came out, uh, Breaking Bad had just ended a few years ago yeah. Cranston was going back to film yeah or I guess he was really delving into delving film into like Trumbo film, had come yeah. out and everything and they're like and Godzilla be, <laughs> and Godzilla and it was like he'd be a great Lex Luthor yeah he has the range for it I agree but yeah no he's supposed to be the the Lex Luthor and Lex has always been the second he's the oh, son oh okay okay and then, I didn't um, know that yeah yeah and then his son in the comics um, has always been like a good guy oh okay future, yeah okay um, so, I mean, that's always been a thing, and that's kind of something that's... But, I mean, you know, it's neither here nor there. Lex Luthor is Lex Luthor. We got who we got. And, like, the other problem, too, is they never really showcased his intelligence, either. Not yep. even in the director's cut. They never really showcased his brilliance. Because Lex Luthor, even at his, you know, campiest in the yeah. 70s, as, like, the... Despite being yeah. clean shaven bald with the mustache twirling, like, I'm yeah. going to tell you how I did this. Yeah. You know, yeah, they didn't really have that. But in the yeah. comics and everything, he showcased his intelligence. And yep. you could see very clearly the calculation. We didn't really get that. It, well, he was just this, in like, rich kid who inherited some right. wealth. And, they, and that's totally undercutting it, too. What's your yeah. superpower? I'm rich. That's like, come on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, like, No shit, you're rich. <laughs> but it's like, I mean, uh, uh, my, my brother and my father, I uh, met up with them for vacation very recently. I would seen them in a while. And they're a huge fan of the TV show Gotham. I don't mm-hmm. know if you follow that show. Yeah, I watched the first three seasons, and yeah, I just I, I saw the first two. And, I just stopped. Um, that that Mooney Fish. What, what, what's the character? Jada Fish Pinkett's, Mooney. That character just keep kept coming back, and I just gave it, gave gave. Yeah, I wasn't show. happy about that either. But I think the thing is, we were talking about Arrow, yeah. and world building, right? And yeah. sequential flashbacks, which is a, a, a writing trope I particularly love yeah. using technique. And Gotham, the problem is, like, the CW shows Arrow, Supergirl now, Supergirl's on CW, Flash, they all really cater to their fan base. And it's important to cater to your fan base, but if you only listen to the fan base, you kind of alienate other portions, right? Yeah. The characters in the story, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking about that. But, like, with the example of Gotham is they introduce Bane. Yeah. 
Um, and I remember season one, they teased Bane and the venom compound that he uses his steroid. Mm-hmm. Um, but they introduced him in this final season of the show. And like he, according to my brother, uh, ambushes Alfred, breaks mm-hmm. his back, mm-hmm. not Batman's because okay. there's a 10 year time skip, which is yeah. okay. But the problem is like they made Bane like this ex cop or something like a friend of Jim Gordon's. Oh uh, yeah. I saw the teaser. Yeah. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, I like the aesthetic of this Bane. Yeah. He looks kind of cool. He looks like, uh, uh, professor poison mm-hmm. kind of. Um, it's a different departure from the classic like luchador mask that the comics and cartoon yeah. Bane wears. It's different from the the pra- the proto t- uh, practical tactical mask yeah. that uh, Tom Hardy's Bane yeah. wears. Like it's it's a cool aesthetic, but like why my problem really here is why do like all the characters have to be related to each other? It's yeah. the insistence that from episode seven when it came out that Ray had to be like Obi Wan's daughter. Like, it's that thing. Like, yeah. does everybody need to be related to everybody yeah. or know everyone? Yeah. Like, the whole point of the Bane introduction in the comics as this event in the 80s that they were leading up to was, like, Batman doesn't know who Bane is. Yeah. Bane just hits the scene hard. Uh-huh. And then Batman has to research. And by the time he figures out who Bane is, Bane has broken into Wayne Manor, deduced mm-hmm. who Bruce Wayne was, mm-hmm. and then beats the crap out of him mm-hmm. and breaks his back. Mm-hmm. So it's like, Bane is completely caught off guard. And in the mm-hmm. cartoon... Like Bane, uh, Batman, Batman is kind of good. Batman does know who Bane is, mm-hmm. but like he has to do research, mm-hmm. and it's like that's his the, detective thing. Yes, the be a detective, mm-hmm. but it's like to make what related to Jim, like Gordon, a friend of his. Like what the hell? The problem is, I have no issue with it, but like if Gotham Once Upon a Time was introduced and marketed as Jim Gordon, yeah, before he became Police Commissioner yeah. Gordon, and then they just completely lost sight of that. And, and now it it's just like, Jim Gordon instead of Batman and all his villains. Well, no, not even. It's like it's now it's like Batman's origin story is literally playing out. So Batman is accosted by this. The Court of Owls is a, a villainous yeah. organization yeah. in the comics. They're like 90s and, uh, and 2000s. Are they introduced but, the Court of Owls in yes, the show? Yes, okay. they were introduced in the show a few seasons ago. Okay. And they're the ones that train him wow, okay. to become Batman. Okay. So like the time skip is he's coming back and he's going to become Batman. How did how does the time skip work? Did, I don't know. I haven't watched the season. We just okay. talked about the, it. Uh, well, uh, what about the actors? Just, okay. I don't know. I don't okay. know. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But it's like like they're showing all of this. And I'm like, mm, I don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah, Gotham was the... Like, it was supposed to be... Like, the first season was fine because it was Jim as a cop. And yes. then there was Mafia, the, yes. the Falcones exactly. and Carmine. Yeah. Carmine Falcones yes. and everything. That yes. was fine. But yes. then... They started introducing every single villain Batman has. And then the Batman kid is still 13. Then after 15 years when he's Batman, all his villains will be old people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that. yeah, right. There's not a lot of intelligence. No connection there. to him. Yeah. I would rather have turn, have Jim Gordon turn into Batman. Yes. Because every apparently every single villain is connected to him in a way. Yes. So that's that's that that's why I stopped. It's just it's so cumbersome, but I mean it's like it's the X Men problem. Yeah. So you have X Men One's fine yeah. film. X Men Two is a great film. X Men Three not a very good film. It was directed by Hollywood's favorite Yes Men, Brett the Rat yeah. Ratner. Um, and then you have the you have the hard reset. You have well, First you have X Men Origins Wolverine with yeah. the the Who Framed Roger Rabbit CGI. Yeah, that was um, so bad. And then you have the Wolverine. <laughs> Which is pretty good. It yeah, was based it on, good. what was it? The Silver Samurai. Yeah. Except um, the last act, but it was good. Uh, and then... First Class. You reboot it with First Class. Days of Future Past. And Days of Future Past is where it connects. But then Days of Future Past is a great film, too, as an X-Men film. But it also is that issue of, like, the divergence, right? Yeah. So, like, how... In the timeline of the original Hugh Jackman films, like... Ian McKellen, Patrick Stewart. Yeah. It's like the 90s, 2000s. They're mm-hmm. old guys. Mm-hmm. We are now with Dark Phoenix, Phoenix getting into the 90s, and yeah. it's still Michael Fassbender and, Patrick and, and yeah. uh, McAvoy, and they look nothing like the and age the wise. The funny thing is, First so, Class started in the 60s, yes. and the same cast is still yeah, here in up, the 90s. They're not made up enough to really show that age. Yeah. Um, so it's the the Gotham issue is yeah. like the villains yeah. and the heroes yeah. are like yeah. the ages are just yeah. completely off yeah. now. 
Um, but I mean, you know, there's no. But I think we it. accept it because the casting is so good. Yes. Well, I mean, Fassbender in his own right is a great actor. And James yeah. McAvoy is a great actor yeah. in his own right too. I and mean, Patrick Stewart and Ian yes, McKellen. Yes, there's yes. such. I think so the great. problems there were because she was fresh off of her uh, Silver Linings playbook win. Yeah. They put a lot of investment into Jennifer Lawrence, and she's kind and of then sick they did. So yeah, now they're kind of done with her. <laughs> Um, because I think she was, you know, just chewing the scenery in Apocalypse. Yeah. yeah. Which leads to another problem I have with superhero movies is that they keep killing all of their villains. They're trying to change that, which I'm happy about. But I think a lot of the films, like, just one off them. I think, I think, not to cut you off, but I think Thanos won't die in Endgame. I don't think the Russo brothers and uh, McFeely and who's the other writer? Oh, uh, uh, Marcus, Christopher Mar- Marcus, and Stephen McFeely. Yeah, 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 those two guys and the Russo brothers. I don't think they're going to kill off Thanos. Well, I'm not saying they kill him off. I was I was talking with my colleague, my one of my new colleagues in the countryside. Mm-hmm. He's in the countryside, um, and he was like, "How would you change Black Panther?" And I was like, "Oh, I hadn't actually thought about that." And I thought about it for a few minutes, and I said, I wouldn't kill Killmonger. I'd yeah. keep him alive. Mm-hmm. I would have T'Challa learn mm-hmm. fra- through Killmonger's mm-hmm. example, this is not a way to lead, mm-hmm. but I shouldn't lead the way I have. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't lead the way my father has either. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, he has the dream vision, right, where he talks to his father and yeah. all that and confronts his ghost. Very Shakespearean. Um, but in the Underground Railroad, I wouldn't have him kill uh, uh, Eric. I mm-hmm. would have him keep him alive. Mm-hmm. And then say, like, this is my first decree as the rightful king of Wakanda. Mm-hmm. I am forgiving you mm-hmm. for what you've done. But I think that and would then, clash with Eric's character, right? I know. And yeah. the idea then, is Eric can either commit suicide honorably or what I was thinking on the spot was he would say, you know, uh, I know. And he'd just exile himself. He'd leave. And I mean, you, there'd be a room for redemption, you know, because like, the thing is with him dying, he yeah. had that closure. He yeah. came full circle yeah. and he realized yeah. it. And it's like, I think you can keep that. You might lose a little bit of the emotional weight yeah. because, of, yeah. you know, yeah. obviously there's a finality to yeah. life when you're dying, right? But I think it would keep some of the emotional weight. But his character just is so great, you know? Yeah. So I was thinking if I had to, I would change it that way. But I would also maybe make it so that T'Challa fails to stop yeah. the warships from leaving. Yeah. And so, like, Wakanda just literally is forced into the spotlight and has to go, yeah, we have a lot of technology yeah. because yeah. our warships just yeah. attacked all yeah. of these countries. So his first decree has to be, go public and say, look, yeah, this is the situation. This is a, a <laughs> That would affect Infinity War a lot. <laughs> it would have affected so much. And I told my friend that. I was like, well, you know, we have the hindsight of yeah. Infinity yeah. War that yeah. we have to work with. Yeah. But that's what I would have done yeah. if I had, you know, known that, you know, the Infinity War could mm-hmm. have finagled with it a little mm-hmm. bit this way. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, maybe not. Uh, they could, like, one of T'Challa's motions could be to make, you know, uh, Wakanda like a, a haven place or something. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. But, I mean, that was, I was saying, like, if I had in 2013, 2014 when I was writing, if I were writing Black Panther, that's what I would have done differently. And, you know, not knowing the pieces that somebody, that they the writers knew then. But I think, like, Apocalypse yeah. is this really hardcore important villain in the X-Men pantheon. Yeah. You can't just kill him like that. Like, I get it. Like, you want to tease the Dark Phoenix Force stuff. Yeah. But, like, maybe have her be so powerful that she sends him to another dimension or something. Or yeah. Like forces him back into, like, hibernation. I don't know. I, I don't think... Apoc- I, I think Apocalypse deserved a storyline like in, in Infinity War and in Endgame. Like, he deserved to be as big as, you know... Yeah, no, in like the... Yeah, exactly. Like, he's he supposed is. to eat. You can't just have his whole origin, 5,000 years of origin in one movie, then happy a villain, and then die off in, in two hours. Yes. Storyline. That was... Uh-huh. And and, and um, about the uh, villain killing thing, right? Uh, the black... The fact the black sheep of MCU, right? Uh, Incredible Hulk. They don't kill Abomination. He's he's imprisoned. He's actually imprisoned. He's not dead. Yeah, they, so they didn't could bring kill him. Back. him. Yes. Yeah, and they mentioned it in the uh, one shot Marvel one shots, right? You know them, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they mentioned that he's uh, frozen in Alaska, in some prison in Alaska. So they can still you know play with that because yeah, Tim Roth, true. he still looks like how he looked like yes. ten years ago. True. So they could bring him back that's if true. they wanted to. That's I mean, true. I'm not sure if they want to, but that's true. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I know a lot of people were teasing, like, why do you have to keep bringing Loki back? But it's like he was kind of essential to the Thor storyline. Yeah. They, they, they 
they killed Hella. She's supposed to be, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a little know. bit. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, like I, you know, the Mandarin. But, well, okay, hold on. The, but the, the, thing, the Mandarin thing is its own can of worms. But but the thing uh, about these huge films is that if you okay, let's just say you don't kill Hella. If you imprison Hella, then the, you know we you know how uh, we know how films are made. If uh, Kid Planchet has two films, of, you know, contract for two films, she can't wait six, seven years for another film. It's going to have to be made in another two or three years, That's which true. means you would have to bring her back. Right, right, right. So if to bring her back, you would have to have another Thor film or have her in the Avengers films or something. Mm. So we actually know That's the true. problems of filmmaking. That's so true. it's kind of I, And I think you know, that, like, that, that is uh, the greatest challenge. To yeah. writing, yeah, it's yeah, the it reality is. of the industry. Yeah, yeah, like that's that. the like tough can, thing about it. it. It really, you have the constraints as a writer of anything. You, mm-hmm. you have an editor, you have a publisher, and they're going to tell you, you know, I would do this. Yeah, publishers can suggest something, and you can ignore a publisher. But the editor. but when you're a film writer, you can't exactly ignore the requirements given by your employer who are signing the, the checks. studio. <laughs> exactly. So that's very true, and I think that is it. It makes writing very difficult. Yep. But I mean, that's very much a situation. I I I do, I do I do agree. I just think DC don't kill General Zod. Maybe don't kill Ares in Wonder Woman. Yeah, Ares is literally supposed to be a the god. utmost arch enemy of Wonder, Wonder Woman. Yeah. You could have Cheetah show up or any, you know. Now they're going to have Cheetah. Yeah, now they are. <laughs> In the 80s. I'm still but so why, annoyed that they didn't why, go to the 70s. Why is uh, Chris Pine's character Steve Trevor, right? Oh, but that's, Why is he there? That's... that's a, I, We I, understand you want Chris Pine's handsome face. Oh. But... But then here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing that I love about it. So the Linda Carter, Linda Carter Wonder Woman show is yeah. a two-parter. Okay. So the first part takes place in uh, World War II, and the second part ta- part takes place in the seventies. Okay. So Steve. It's Trevor, made in the seventies, right? Yes. Okay. So the first part has uh, Steve Trevor. Okay. And the second part has the same actor playing his son. Wow. Well, okay. So I was like, you know what? If the show did it, at least indulge me and have Steve Trevor's son just be played by the same actor. I don't think the character did have like have space to have a kid. Right. That's true. Um, but like you, you know, you never know. Maybe he had like an illegitimate kid back home or something, like you know, war baby. Um, but like I think that would be funny, and I would, I think it would be a wonderful nod to the TV show. Would, yeah, but would would the modern mainstream film going audience accept that? Accept the accept that Chris Pine is playing the son of the same character he played uh, in a movie that's think, four years I ago. I think yes, if the film doesn't take itself too seriously. And Wonder Woman had its moments. Um, I think if the film is like all dark and brooding, then that obviously is there's some silly element to that, and that distracts. Yeah. But if the film has a lot of levity and heart to it, I think you can have fun with it. Like if it if it if the writer shows a degree of self awareness. And, like, maybe a passing comment about, yeah. like, you look just like, like your, your father, father. Yeah. you know? And he says, oh, thanks, I get that. And he'd be like, thanks, I get that all the time. You know, something like that. Then it would be kind of like, okay, they're aware, and we can take it, we can buy it. But then, then if he gets romantically involved with... Which they do. <laughs> they do. It's going to be the Cap thing, Captain America yeah. thing with, you know... He's good. He, I mean, Captain had it pretty good. He went from Haley Atwell to Emily Van Camp. Yeah, <laughs> um, like that. <laughs> that was another thing. That I was, was telling weird. you about when, uh, not Winter. I was telling you about Civil War, and, like missing scenes, and I feel like they, that relationship didn't come from nowhere. Yeah, but it but, just it it was a little better than the Thor. Uh, not Thor. The than the. He's not, oh, God damn it. Then the Black Widow Hulk stuff. Oh my god, that but was terrible. But the, the Captain America <laughs> Agent 13 stuff yeah. kind of came a little fast too. Yeah, it did, um, it did. And I think that was mostly in service of the, the, the cutaway gag. Which I is think... the Bucky and uh, 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 Falcon in the yeah. car like just kind of being bros about it. I think that was that in was service funny. of... But uh, Agent Carter, Peggy Carter... This funeral was in the same movie, right? Yes. <laughs> the, so that, if you if, the, literally, if you think about it in timeline, yeah, they made out in the highway like two days later. Yeah, that's after. yeah, that's a bit yeah. 
There's a, again, I was telling you about that YouTube channel. There's a phenomenal, he, his early videos, he got his start doing a, who's a scrawl mm-hmm. uh, hypotheticals. Mm-hmm. And his first video, Nando's first video, Nando V Movies, first video was that Agent Carter was a mm-hmm. scrawl. And then his follow up was, what if War Machine is a scroll? Because yeah. then, speaking of the tongue in cheek stuff, yeah. then it could be, oh, yeah. you look different. Yeah, yeah. You know, Rhodey, you look different yeah. between the two movies. And it's like, <laughs> that could be when he got nabbed by the scrolls. It's fascinating. I, I don't know. I mean, there's so much politicization behind Captain Marvel. I mean, that's a, oh boy, that and the politicization of films mm-hmm. alone is just such a complex situation because my my whole thing is i'm all for inclusivity and all that but it's like this is still a very corporate product yeah you know like if you want to be inspired by something yeah like watch like if bill street could talk you know mm-hmm. like <laughs> yeah <laughs> there are like other films that like really have that resonance yeah and i understand that with big mu- budget movies comes big marketing yeah. and a lot of exposure yeah so obviously, yeah, if you have good coding and signals yeah. that are very positive and encouraging, yeah, then you're reaching a bigger audience. But, you know, I, 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 think... I'm, I don't want to get into that too deeply. But I'm just saying that Captain Marvel, the fascinating thing there was, I mean, mm, I'm going to tread carefully here. Um, <laughs> they they made the scrolls yeah. out to be the victims. Yeah. The creator of the scrolls and the architect of the Kree scroll war said both sides were equally atrocious. Yeah. So I think it's kind of fascinating to, that the film decided to make it a very I think, one-sided. I think uh, they can and... kind of break on that. I think because um, the the scrolls who played out to be the victims in the movie, right? They're just a very small clan mm, of okay. scrolls led seen... by led so, by Ben Mendelsohn's yes, character. Yeah. Uh, I, and I don't think they express the idea that the whole scrolls race is right. that is as innocent. Right. I don't think so. So I think they can, you know. Uh, right. But I like the the twist of uh, uh, um, the uh, what is it? The Marvel core? What did yeah, yeah, Marvel yeah. Captain Marvel. Yeah, but the no, Marvel character. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But like Marvel and the what the hell are the core called? The Star Core or something? Uh, Star Force. Star Force. Yes. Yeah. Um, that twist. Yeah, I saw a mile away because they cast that same guy yeah. from Guardians One, who yeah. is a Kree operative. Yeah, so Ronan. Like, yeah, Ronan and Korath. Yes, yeah. Korath. So they bring him back, yeah. and he's working with Jude Law. Yeah. So it's like, hello. So that's a very fascinating. Marvel's reached a point where, like, in doing their retconning, yeah. like you kind of are getting the spoilers. Yeah. They're happening. That's the only big downside of this mega thing yeah. that they're accomplishing. Yeah. Is that like if you retcon it and you tie the universe together, then you can kind of, if you pay attention, piece it together. Mm-hmm. Now the Korath uh, being a Kree agent, yeah. Uh, no, Co- yeah, Kree, yeah, yeah, being a Kree agent in Cop- Captain Marvel is not a huge spoiler yeah. because he's just a bit character in Guardians. Yeah. But like, if you pay attention and you go, oh, wait a minute, it's the same guy. Is that the same character? Yeah. It is. He looks the same. Yeah. Then it's like, you can kind of, wait a minute, he worked for Ronan. Ronan's coming back, so does he work for Ronan? Yes. So it's like, you know, like you can kind of tie it all together and potentially spoil it for yourself. And I know like before that, there was the spoilers of merchandising. Yeah. Like Star Wars toys were yeah, coming out. Yeah, they do that all oh, the time. Oh, yeah. But I think it's very fascinating moving forward. I know with Infinity War, we had the post-Infinity War movies coming out. Yeah. And we're like, okay, so is this set in a pre-Infinity or post-Infinity War yeah. timeline? Yeah. And if it's set in a post-Infinity War timeline, then we know how Endgame's going to end. Obviously, they're going to win. In all likelihood, it really would be truly ballsy mm-hmm. if they still lost. Yeah. But we know they're going to win yeah. and everything's going to In a way. In a way. I, I, I just, you know. I think, I think they're going to do it with like the Game of Thrones ending. Because they keep talking about the Game of Thrones ending that it's going to be super bittersweet. Like nobody's going to actually win. Like, they would kind of win, but they don't, you know, that kind of thing. I think Endgame's going to do that. They're like, going to send the Maybe Thanos is kind of de- defeated or something, but the loss is still this, still there or uh-huh. something. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's the way they're Well, gonna... I think there are going to be certain characters that aren't going to come back. Yeah, because exactly. Because of magical forces, ex machina. Yeah. You're going to say, the nature of this character's death, we cannot bring them yeah. back. Yeah. But I think... I made the very bold claim. <laughs> okay. Very bold. And I was shot down immediately by my friends when we saw Infinity War here in, okay. in uh, Ulaanbaatar uh, I guess last year. Um, I was like, so, there are, well, how many, six, seven OG yeah, six, uh, Avengers yeah, left? Yeah, yeah. And All it's of them like, they're trying to bring back 
six dead, right? Something to that effect. Six what? Six uh six dead Avengers okay. that were dusted. And I was like, what if the architects and if this is going to the actual comics of okay. Infinity War, because Thanos was motivated by his love for, for death. death. Yeah. Which so, could have been Hella. Yeah. Which could have been Kate Blanchett. This yes. should have been awesome. <laughs> I mean, oh my god, Josh Brolin and Kate and Blanchett, Kate Blanchett like, making, out, making in space. out in space would be weird and awesome. wonderful at the same time. <laughs> that would have been awesome. <laughs> Cause the thing was she played it with so much ham. But because she's Kate Blanchett, you can it's still it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It and was, then Josh Brolin has just been working it up. And Josh Brolin is just like a guy who's like, I don't give a shit. Um, <laughs> but like the architects of yeah, the universe, yeah. right? I don't know what their actual terminology yeah. is because like they sound so similar to the guys from the Green Lantern uh-huh. Corps, the big heads. Okay, Watchers, the Watchers, the the Guardians of the Universe or something like that. The, 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 there's the, a, there's the Watchers and then there's like the Guardians. Okay. and then one has one, the other has okay. the other. But like they come forth mm-hmm. and say, "Okay, we can do this. Mm-hmm. Reverse the court action of the sevens mm-hmm. of the the Infinity Stones, right? The mm-hmm. six Infinity Stones. Mm-hmm. But each one requires the life of one person. Uh-huh. So uh, my radical thinking was, what if the six original Avengers die, uh-huh. like so that they can bring back the new Avengers? Yeah. And I, it was immediately shot down. And I was I like, think- that is so un- unrealistic. But I was like, if they took that chance, if they even thought about it for a minute, that would have been incredibly bold. I think, I think, um, I think they'll get there, like halfway there. Because uh, the thing is, they're already oh, well, yeah. not an officially, but it's already obvious that they're doing a Hawkeye show on Disney Plus. Oh, so really? Hawkeye is going to survive. And, um, Thor recently became super fan favorite because of Thor Ragnarok and Infinity War. So they're interested in exploring more with Thor. Hey, man, but, you know. <laughs> but, but I do think they actually are exploring the idea of killing off Tony Stark and, and Rogers. Cap- yeah, Captain yeah, Cap- Cap- yeah, those two make the most sense. I think, because, yeah. because with, with, uh, with Steve, he has Bucky. Yeah. Is, and he also has Falcon. Yeah. Um, so there's a very one to one like success yeah. line of succession, um, but then with Iron Man two, uh, <laughs> Iron Man three, yeah. he had the boy that yeah. he hung out with when he crash landed, and, and, and Iron from Lad, the casting, Iron Lad's coming back. Yeah, the kid is so, coming back. Yeah, and I know Hawkeye's daughter is like I can't remember the what kid her, Bishop. Yes, yeah, I don't is that her That's, moniker. Yeah, oh. no, the kid Bishop is her name, oh, okay. but Hawkeye she goes yeah. by Hawkeye. She later, oh, she takes yeah, on his yeah, name. Yeah. Oh, I thought she had a separate name. But like, I think they have like Teen Avengers and Spider Man. Young Avengers. Avengers. Or Young Avengers. Yeah. There we go. And like Spider Man's yeah, going to lead yeah. that. So I think they have it set up. But I think very much so that Captain America is going to die and probably, well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> he could afford to walk away. Robert Downey Jr. has made so much money out of these. Movies. I think I think at this point they can do that. And we, we were talking about this, uh, the future of MCU beyond Endgame, right? Beyond Far From Home, because the Far From Home is the only film that has official release date for now, right? Oh. It's, in this, it, it's it, but do this, we know if the story? No, we don't. We takes don't. Place before or after? We it, don't. I think it's after, but we don't know. We still don't know. But I th- we think it's after, right? But there's no other movies officially like you know um, uh, have a release date. But okay. there are films that are obviously coming out, like um, Black Widow, Shang Chi. There's Doctor Strange two, Black Panther two, Captain Marvel two. Uh, what are the Eternals? You know these movies are actually Spider Man three. They're they're obviously coming out. That's not a surprise, right? So we were thinking when we um, there are nine more official release dates for Marvel movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year there's only two. Which is in in game and far from home in the summer in July. Oh, oh left, and there's left there, in the year. Yeah, okay. uh, but in the in the fall or winter there is no uh, uh, Marvel movies. Oh but God. starting from 2020, there's three movies each year until the end of 2022. So there are nine movies. But I, when we put uh, those films that are actually in pre-production to those slates, right? Guardians three, Black Widow, uh, Shang Chi, and all those movies, mm-hmm. you can see that these movies don't have to be connected to each other. All those movies can be their own thing. That is very true. So, for a whole nine movies, three years run, you don't have to connect anything to each other. And then, starting with 2023, you could maybe set up the X Men, but small. In, you Fantastic know, like, Four. Fantastic Four, or the Young Avengers and everyone. So, I think because of that, Cap and Stark are definitely going to die. I think. 
Because even if they die, they don't have to like use Chris Evans and Robert Downey Jr.'s face for the next nine years, the three years anyway. Hmm. I think because all those films don't require those characters. Already, they're developing like nine movies, I think, and there are nine release dates. So that's what I think. I think uh, and and uh, Black Widow could die too. I think and the movie can be a prequel. It doesn't matter. Because Scarlett Johansson pretty much looks the same, it doesn't matter. Right. I think, and Hawkeye is not going to die, and uh-huh. and Thor, I they might be a little, you know, on the fence about. Well, that. and like if as long as if if they kill him off and replace him with Beta Ray Bill, that's all that matters. Oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> Who who would you cast as Beta Ray Bill? I mean, I <laughs> my joking my joke casting would be um, uh, uh, Will Arnett. Okay, <laughs> but his voice would be nice, though, right? Like, oh, hey, I'm Beta Ray Bill. <laughs> yeah. just basic. I mean, it'd be funny if you gave him the personality of Bojack Henry Horseman. <laughs> <laughs> but with his British accent or with his no, his, his British with his accent. Walker, with no. his Walker CIA. Agent. No, no, well, not Walker, but just his full British. <laughs> <laughs> funny. I mean, because I kind of want British actors to do their own. Like have their own accents in the Marvel movies. I mean, I, mean, yeah, I understand I, I, Steven I, mean, I, I think what's his name? Oh, what's the Shang Chi? Shang Chi, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, damn. I, I get that Asia's hot, but like, it's so depressing that there's not a more mainstream Asian superhero in the Marvel pantheon than yeah. that. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. that just boggles my mind. Like DC has the closest we have is Quick from Agents of Shield. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, or like Jubilee from the X Men. Yeah, the X Men. Yeah. Um, but like, what? That's so sad. Um, <laughs> but like, it'd be cool. But I was, I was commenting when I, when Guardians Two first came out and Mantis, her character, I was like, what is that accent? Yeah. Is it like this? Is I was like perturbed. <laughs> I was like, is this like some stereotypical thing? Mm-hmm. I find out Palm Clementioff is uh, half Korean, half French Canadian. Yeah. And uh, that's actually how she sounds. Yeah, I was yeah, like, it, oh, it, 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 it I is. I feel yeah. so bad. Um, but um, uh, it'd be cool. Maybe Beta Ray Bill could be voiced by an Asian person, John Cho. Uh, John Cho could be nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, the character would be CGI yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but like, I mean, it's just like you, it's more, more Asian. Uh, who's folks. the guy who played the drunken master guy in uh, Iron Fist? Oh, I don't know. I didn't one watch. episode, just one episode. That guy was super cool. Like there was this Asian guy, mm-hmm. like who's an actual martial artist in real life, and he's a good actor. Huh. Like he, he. Um, That's hard because he auditioned so to play uh, Iron Fist, but the Iron Fist character is Caucasian, so yeah. he never. He was oh, of never course, cast. yeah. It works. It ugh, the knife always cuts both ways. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that guy was cool. I think I wish that guy would like you know. And the thing about Sung Kang, right? The Asian casting. Because uh, most of the you know big movies when they cast Asian uh, people were either they're beautiful woman like Claudia Kim or whatever <laughs> in Age of Ultron. Well, that just, not, I mean, just, that was just there because the film was uh, filmed, filmed in, in Korea. Korea. But or like or Fang Bingbing, you know, like uh, these characters oh, were. Oh yeah, big in China. Yeah, big in like Kong Skull Island. You know, yeah. they needed some Chinese market because it was co-produced by a Chinese film company or whatever. Or if they're male characters, they're just, you know, martial artists. They just fight, right? But I love the thing they did with Sung, uh, Sung Kang's character, Han, uh-huh. in Fast and the Furious series. Oh, yes, yeah. He couldn't fight. He doesn't do anything. He just looks cool, and he just drives. And that's it. And I loved that. Like, he didn't have to be a martial artist, master, whatever. Yeah, no, it was just a he dude. actually got his ass handed to him. It was like, oh, awesome. yeah. And then, like, you know, they, they flesh him out later. And he yeah. and Gal Gadot have a thing. It's, yeah. It's cool. Like, that, that's He fine. gets the girl. I, and I, I actually have, a, like, a renewed appreciation for the fast films. Because <laughs> they just are so simplistic. Yeah. But the thing is, it's not like the women are all eye candy. But they're not objectified eye candy. They're, yeah. they're given agency. Yeah. They're given ability. That's the cool thing about it. They're yeah. never like, you know, like they have their own sense of responsibility. And I, I'm like, that's how you should do yeah. it. Maybe consider hiring a woman writer to write the dialogue for them. But like, because it, but then I was like, no, that's okay. Because the, the fast films are so pared down. It's all utilitarian dialogue. Yeah. Every line is to progress the plot. Yeah. But speaking of rehashed villains, I mean, Charlie's Theron, they kept her oh, alive. That, <laughs> Charlie's Theron was in a different movie. She, she was. was no, she was totally chewing. Charlize Theron and Vince Vin Diesel. They were in a drama movie, 
But win, uh, but but uh, Jason <laughs> Statham, Statham, and uh, Dwayne Johnson, they well, were no, in that, the Fast and Furious. Yes, they were in watching, the Fast and Furious. Watching, watching the chemistry of those two really made me go, okay, Hobbs and Shaw can work. Yeah, I, I was, did you watch the trailer? I, the I, new one? No, new no. I I saw some of it. <laughs> the new one is ridiculous. Is that the one where you're slamming the guy's face into the? Yeah, okay, then I saw. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. yeah um, but um, I mean, I think like that'll work. Yeah. Um, I just said that the cast, some of the cast of the Fast franchise are kind of pissed because Dwayne Johnson, yeah, Dwayne they, Johnson, them, yeah. and then like made uh, Hobbs and Shaw fast track. It's Tyrese Gibson and Vin Diesel again with the you know the problems. Yeah, well, Ludacris doesn't really care, you know. Yeah, uh, Michelle Rodriguez, probably Michelle doesn't Rodriguez, care. yeah, Michelle Rodriguez doesn't care, and Vin Diesel and Tyrese Gibson are the ones who are important most. Are the I, most, so. yeah. I mean, they I, publicly, I you know, declare war with Dwayne Johnson, oh. so. Yeah. But you know, whatever. I, I think, think things would have been better if Paul Walker was actually alive. But I gotta admit that the way they played him out was so amazing. intelligent. That, that was, was really amazing. tastefully done. Yeah. I mean, I'm so concerned. Okay, you know, I know we don't want to date this thing, but like, I'm so concerned about episode nine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, they they didn't, to my knowledge, they didn't film jack shit anything left oh, of Carrie Fisher. They they did explain it though. They didn't. Uh, they used uh, unused deleted footage. The little scene kind of footage. Okay. Un, uh, what do you call it? Unused well, footage? No, but for all we from know, Force Awakens. Okay, yeah, that's fair. All right, but for all we know, that's like Abrams does that too. His teasers have, you know, footage that doesn't make it to the final cut. Yeah. So, I mean, he used to. I don't yeah. think he did for Force Awakens, but... Force that, Awakens, he didn't. Yeah, for, all, much but for all, yeah but for all we know, those scenes are, you know, probably not... Some of it might not make it to the final yeah. cut. We don't know. But uh, the idea was that uh, Leia, General Leia, right mm-hmm. now, uh, she would have had a big, big story arc and big influence on the story in Episode Nine, and then she passed away before I mean, the script was done. Do you so, wa- do, do you want to speculate? <laughs> no, I, don't, I okay. think I think they will just use her as minimal as possible. No, I was thinking about Luke. I was because oh. I mean it's the rise of Skywalker, and I will be absolutely livid. I will throw shit yeah. if Rey ends up being a fucking Skywalker or like a Kenobi. I I really think the idea of the Force that if you know the the, yeah. the Last Jedi has its problems, but I like the idea that the Force. As a construct, anybody can have it. Yeah. That's really what Star Wars should be. It Dark should be inspiring. Yeah, really. exactly. It should be inspiring. Yeah. You know, that's how you can spin it and make even more money off of. I kids. think. I think Ray. <laughs> I, I don't think uh, Abrams will turn Ray into uh, a Kenobi or. A yeah. Star. So like, I don't think yeah. so. Uh, but I think the rise of Skywalker to title is like. I think Ray would aspire to be a Skywalker like Luke or something. In so. that kind of sense. I think. I think. I think. I think it might be like a like a legacy thing for Luke. Like yeah. Luke's re- redemption arc is lived or fulfilled vicariously through yeah. Ray because he has his own arc and he f- redeems himself. Yeah. But like th- beyond his redemption, like his ability to fulfill his vision, yeah. I think would be realized to other people. I was just wondering if is everybody speculating that Palpatine is going to be a Force ghost that hangs around like some kind of haunted mm-hmm. sunken ship ghost. Yeah. On the Death Star. Yeah, Death Star 2. So I was wondering if that's what they're going to do. If th- Luke was going to be a Force ghost. And I think that I, I, I fascinated. Fa- it's so fascinating to me that I, from the teaser, mm-hmm. from just that teaser, I saw a lot of parallels from the Avatar animation world. that From that universe. The Last okay. Airbender and the Legend of Korra. Uh-huh. So what what I saw was the thousands of generations living within you, right? Mm-hmm. You know, Ray is basically the representation of Jedi, Jedi whole Jedi history now, mm-hmm. more or less, mm-hmm. right? And it's her fight, but also she's a je- representation of thousand generations, and she has all of their knowledge, not just literally from those books, but as a force ghost, whatever, right? And that is a huge parallel from the Avatar universe. The Avatar has connection to all the previous Avatars. You can get their learn their learn from their wisdom, right? One or the other way. Yes, that is an yeah, awesome thing. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And also the going back thing. Like uh, I think I think the our heroes, right? Poe Dameron, Finn, Ray, whoever, Chewie. I think they have to go back to literally and figuratively to the Return of Jedi, Return of the Jedi. I think they have to go back to Death Star 2. They have to, like, I don't know, learn something, find something, figure something out. 
that has something to do with Palpatine and the Death Star 2 and the Battle of Endor. Something to do. I don't know what, but something to do with that. And learn from that. Not I, because that's the villain or the, you know, uh, the main end, end game to it. I mean, I know that, like, Kylo Ren has been to Endor because he retrieved Vader's skull. Vader yeah. He cremated yeah, Endor. He has so, been there, yeah. So, like, it's not beyond us to do that. I think maybe if they have the Knights of Ren show up. Yeah. Like, finally, yeah, please. I, I, there, there, there was this leaked promotional art that actually has... Uh, Night, but they debunked it. it though, right? That it was a fake. No, it wasn't. Oh, I think really? it. I think it was legit. Yeah. Oh. There are a lot of quite quite a few things that were leaked that was you know actually legit. But and I think the going back thing is also parallel with the Legend of Korra. You have you watched it? I still haven't. Okay. <laughs> okay. The third season has this one of the greatest. Like I've had the fictional, spoiled. I've had it spoiled for me. Like the greatest fictional villain of any uh-huh. like movie animation. Yeah, that I've heard I've that each had. season's had a really good villain yeah. because they're so grounded. Yeah, Zahir, There was this villain called Zahir, right? Uh-huh. She uh, no, he literally breaks Korra. Like literally, like he poisons her. He um, uh, breaks her connection with all her the previous avatars and everything. Oh, okay. Like he breaks the avatar cycle and everything. Like, that guy was super philosophical and everything, right? Oh, like, through, like, like philosophy? Yeah, oh, like... It just like, makes her doubt everything? Yeah, like, like oh. it was amazing. And then the the next season, Korra, the whole, like, almost the entirety of the season, Korra had PTSD because of that. She had to rediscover herself. She went on a fucking exile for three years and everything. It was well, depressing. Yeah, it was depressing as fuck, right? She tried to, like, you know, discover herself. She's ag- agonized by it and everything. And then... Finally, she had to like find herself and find her power to face this another new, you know, dicta- right. dicta- dictator type of villain. Right, right, right. She had to go back to Zahir, the one who broke her in the first place. And she went to Zahir and found herself in a way. Like to, to rediscover what she had so wait, to find what, what, to. What, what's his capacity in the, the second time? Is he still a villain or is he more? No, of a he's just now? he's just imprisoned. He can't go out. He can't escape. So he's just there. Hmm. So he's kind of like a monk already. So he doesn't need to escape. He's just meditating. So Korra goes back to him and, you know, uh, tries to get over the problems that she had because of him. And then, you know, goes back to fight uh, whatever ha- fight that she had in, hmm, the, in the end of the season. So I don't think it's that, you know, uh, parallel, but at, like like that, you know what I mean? Like. Ray kind of has to face her past, or maybe Kylo Ren has to face her face his past. Maybe yeah, because yeah. we, I think I'm getting the feeling that um, Rise of Skywalker, Walker's main antagonist, the main villain, like this whole story arc, won't be Kylo Ren. I don't think so. I don't think it will be like Kylo Ren, the the Emperor of the First Order, and no, just fighting and no, dying. I don't think. I don't think so. But I'm I'm hesitant to make it somebody familiar because i mean the star wars fandom is probably you know fandoms alone is another topic we could mm-hmm. get into for hours or not but like the star wars fandom is just so divisive and you can't please them anymore yeah you have the one so half that's like i want something new you give them something new this is terrible give me something i like and then you have other people that are like let's play it safe give me something i know and yeah it's like yeah, it's so annoying. So I'm I'm hesitant to have Palpatine be once again the guy who's behind it all, even in death. That to me undercuts Vader's redemption arc. Also, the Force Awakens and the Last Jedi too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I wish I think uh, Abrams will bring back uh, Snoke in a way. Not literally because he's dead for sure, but in a way, like in, <laughs> like his. <laughs> what if he, like he's like. Like uh, uh, like play Dark Souls. Do you know there's no. the, um, uh, the third game? There's this boss. I can't remember their names, but they're two brothers, and one of them's like a cripple. What if what, <laughs> what if he's, he's like carrying Snoke's like upper body and like just what if he's like Darth Maul, like robot legs or something? Oh, that would be <laughs> <laughs> robot legs. Um, well, Solo right kind of debunked all of that, right? Yeah, Darth Maul came back, in that and movie. then they have a final showdown with Kenobi in the show. Yeah, in in Rebels. Yeah, yeah. He, so it's all canon. So, but oh man. Yeah, but I don't like. I th- I don't think Snoke will be brought back in a big way. But I think Abrams will want to like establish that he was this big guy or something. You know, like mention him or something. Well, I mean, obviously he's uh uh he's somebody that even Luke knew. Yeah. So I mean, he shouldn't just be a nobody. Luke yeah. wouldn't waste his time on some fucking nobody. Yeah. He's like. 
you know, he was so powerful he could seduce Kylo Ren or yeah. maybe, you know, Ben and do all this stuff. Yeah. It's like, yeah, make him a somebody. Yeah. You know, so I mean if they explore that, sure. I mean the 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 shock for me is not so much uh Kylo Ren killing him. Yeah. I think for me the, the shock would be if he ended up being just some fucking nobody. Yeah, that's, I would have that no, would be I would have no problem with it if they play it right. Yeah. And you know, like he was like a puppet ruler all along or something. I think there was this character from the novels which is now the legends, they're called legends, right? Uh from the novel that there was this character who was it? Um I don't remember the name. Uh, there was this character who was a general in the Empire. Mm-hmm. And when the Empire fell, he was uh, with his fleet in the outer like, yes. rim of the galaxy. Oh, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember his name either. Yeah, I don't remember. But then when he came back to the, you know, you know the, whatever the story is taking place, Empire was already fallen. You know, while Vader was dead. The Emperor was dead. Everybody was gone. And, you know, Luke and Han were celebrating. And then he went into a kind of an exile. And then he built things up from the start. And he was kind of force sensitive, so I think that character could have been Snoke in a way. That would be f- pretty cool. Um, I I was always of the belief that Snoke was just a guy that like Luke brought in to help train mm-hmm. the people, the the new school yeah. of Jedi. Some old uh, yeah, Jedi right, guy, right, right, right. force sensitive guy. Yeah, yeah, and then he betrays Luke basically yeah. basically it's simple as that and then like Luke slaughters everybody and then has the Knights of Ren yeah. followers join him I think that'd be cool I um, think they have to give him some weight now in in the last film Snoke right? or, Snoke, oh, Snoke, Snoke. Okay. because he's like apparently all, all too powerful right yes. and you can't have that kind of an all too powerful who's apparently hundreds of years old May at least a hundred years old and look physically looks like he went through some shit and be nobody. You can't have that, right? Like you have to, like, you know, give him some weight. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I just, because if yeah. if Rise the Rise of Skywalker, even if it's like a super, like a perfect movie, like a great movie, but still doesn't explain anything to do with Snoke, then looking back, it's gonna be super stupid. Like you know what I mean? Yeah, I think in hindsight. I mean, it's just the again the big problem is the story. If we go back to storytelling, right? Mm-hmm. Um, one person, Mongolian filmmaker, was talking to. She was saying, uh, like the the problem is when you diversify. And the Mongolians try to diversify their storytelling. Sometimes they lose track of the story structure. Yeah, and she's of the firm camp of the through line, which she says is the through line. And that is plot and character development progressing forward towards some end. Right. Yeah. Um. And I think, you know, Star Wars loses that because, again, it's like a good essay. You know, if you're trying to make an argument for something or debate, right? If you're trying to make an argument for something, you have reasons to back it up. And if you think of each reason as an episode in Star Wars or yeah. like as a film, it's leading to a bigger whole if yeah. it's not some isolated one-off thing, yeah. right? So you have you introduce the idea you're arguing and you resolve it and it ties into the next idea. And all of these things together will lead you to your big message. Yeah, and I think that's very much something that Star Wars, the sequel trilogy, at least, kind of jeopardized. I'm not going to say they lost it, but mm-hmm. it's something that they kind of ran the risk of losing. Yeah, plain and simple. So it's just I don't know, man. And the thing, uh, weird thing is, Force Awakens and Last Jedi don't feel like they're the same franchise. You know what I mean? There's they, such they, a degree of just... like, there's so much resolution. Yeah, not resolution for the Last Jedi, and it's the Canto bite, the Canto bite or bite, bite, can, bite. Canto bite stuff was just so irrelevant. Yeah, and that's just because I think the Ryan Johnson knew I have to write something for Finn to do. Yeah, and then the problem was, you know, Kathleen Kennedy I think was breathing down his neck, going, "Well, we got called out by the Asian community for not having any yeah. Asians in Star Wars that were meaningful characters that weren't like token blind wise yeah. Asian man." <laughs> um. So write an Asian character yeah. and make her significant. Yeah. And so he was like, oh, shit. So he came up with Rose Tico and yeah. then like was like, well, no. why would I do with her? Yeah. So they had, I think that's my speculation is that's what happened. The weird Catholic thing about King. Last Jedi is Rey didn't have a story. Poe didn't have a story. Finn was shit. And these three are the main, like, you know, our, it's yeah. it was supposed think, to be think, the Han, yes. Leia look yes. of this I story. think, I think, well, if you think about it too, in, in the last, uh. But Kylo Ren did the return gain. Of, return of the Jedi, Han didn't really have a story after he, um, 
was unfrozen from yeah. carbonite. Yeah. He was just, that was his arc was done. Yeah. And then it was just do this thing. Yeah. He, <laughs> so the he wanted to die third, in Empire Strikes yes, Back, right? Entire, yeah. His entire second and third act is him just standing in front of a shed. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. He doesn't really have much to do. Yeah. But yeah, but you know, again, his arc in the first and the second one alone was just so compelling. Yeah. And that, complete. Yes, exactly. It was very thorough. And I wish Finn- but Ray was on par to have an interesting diverging narrative, but there was a bit of an arc too where she's going, Well, I'm the old wet methods are not the only way yeah. of learning. And yeah. obviously, you know, this curmudgeonly old bastard luke yeah he's telling me to fuck off yeah. so fine i'll go fuck yeah. off then yeah. like i'm not gonna keep like pestering him like you know some jedis from the prequels yeah. would have done yeah. i'm gonna just get the answers myself yeah and i think that's kind of cool but it's like you know it's such a, it's a ball of thread you have yeah. to be careful with the point what you, thread you tug on the yarn will just come undone um I... post story is kind of interesting too but it's so like it? contrary it's so contrary his development is so like why break him down that way? Yeah. Why why have him grow that way by having him break down? The problem with his story is uh, Laura Dern with the purple hair yeah. wasn't given enough reason yeah. to be the way she Exactly, was. exactly. So if she was given a very compelling reason, yeah. then yeah. Poe's arc would make a little more sense. Yeah, but yeah, because that conflict did not make sense. No. And it didn't have to happen. It's one thing if they had a spy. You yeah, know, like that, I think, was what I was looking for. I was like, mm-hmm. so is there a spy? Is that why you're being so secretive? Yeah. Like, no. Yeah, no. Fuck just that. Yeah, that was so. that was stupid. Yeah. And I think uh, after Last Jedi, the one character that got the better end of it was Kylo Ren. Because he had the best story and he yeah. had the most emotional arc of it, of it all. Yeah, yeah. I think, But I think the problem is then they, they went and made him kind of comic-y too. In the end. Yes, they, they, they had him build up so much. Um, there's a great YouTube channel <laughs> with a very devout mm-hmm. following. They are they're claim to fame with Star Wars, mm-hmm. so of course, um, Red Letter Media. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're based out of Wisconsin, and uh, they he adopted this persona. The founder of the company adopts this persona, and he breaks down movies. and He he didn't like the Last Jedi, and he was like, you know, my thinking is the Last Jedi should have ended with Ren extending his hand mm-hmm. and then offering. Ray to just full on go from gray to dark mm-hmm. and then leave it as a didn't he do thing. that no <laughs> I think he I, he did after killing Snoke and killing all the uh, Praetorian guards right he did off the- yeah but he was saying that the film should have ended there. oh okay okay instead I- we get like blow that thing out of the sky like you get him like screaming yeah. and like he's all comic yeah. and like and, and General Hux character like he was Kind of funny in Force Awakens, but he still was. He was, he was effective. At he was really still, driving home that yeah, fascist. Yeah, imagery. he was still a general of that huge army, right? Yes, they completely. They. But completely, now he's just this little character, literally being dragged around and shit. It yeah, was, he's a punching bag. Yeah, it was he, he's been neutered in the last. And time. Finn should have died. I, I want to see John Boyega in Episode Nine, but from the story in Last Jedi, he should have died. Like, yes, it, like yes. Rose should have, yeah. shouldn't have come. What the hell? <laughs> like, we save who we love or something. Why the fuck would you love him? It's so stupid. <laughs> well, I mean, yes. Like, based on that growth, yes, it makes sense that Finn would die. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, based because on because that. his whole arc is he was been his running away from yeah. things. And, and now finally he's finally him, fighting yeah, for it. And for, he's sacrificing yeah, himself he's to save up, the resistance. He's standing up and he's taking ownership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he just should have died. So by, right all, there by there. all laws of Campbellian circle, he should have died. He should have died. And then and then in episode 9, Kelly Mary Trans character, or uh, Rose, right? Mm-hmm. She, she, she would have the bigger arc, right? Like, Finn is dead. She feels guilty or something. Like, you know, she would have a bigger story. Yeah, that's she could have become the, I don't know, the, the av- team avatar, team Ray, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, that, that could have been an, like a welcome change. Who knows? I, yeah, that's, that's actually a really good idea. But I think, yeah, the, the, the Last Jedi is just such a You also want to cater to Asians too, right? Well, uh, yeah, so. I, I'm of the belief, yes. So, um, so make Rose bigger character. I, I mean, yeah, it's like, it just seems so like what, what we got. With the introduction of Rose Tico, it was just so forced, yeah, and so obvious, yeah. And it was clearly, I, I think there's, they're never going to release any information from the inside that indicates this. Uh-huh. But I'm certain that's what happened. 
they called out Kat, JJ and Kathleen Kennedy for Force Awakens. Mm-hmm. It's like, are we going to get any more Asians? Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, we're working on it. So we got Ip Man in Rogue One and then we yeah. got Rose Tico in Episode Eight. And it's like, but her character was just so forced in, pun yeah. intended. Like, it was just literally yeah. just shoehorned yeah. in for the sake of diversity. Yeah. Like, I, again, have no problem with, I was just talking about this. I rewatched the Oceans trilogy yeah. and they hold up pretty yeah. well. Even Oceans 12. Um, and, like, the problem I have with Oceans 8 which I didn't even finish because it was just so bland, is, like, it could be an interesting story. It doesn't need to be Oceans. Yeah. Like, it didn't have to be an Oceans movie. If you make, if you write the characters well, mm-hmm. you don't have to have them married to something that people know. Yeah. So, like, Rose Tico, if you wrote her properly, yeah. and you didn't just go, oh, this is a character I'm writing because I need to have this character. Yeah. yeah. Then it like it puts more pressure on the writer because yeah. you have to like force the peg into the 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 hole if it's yeah. not the right shape and you're yeah. like I gotta do this yeah. I'm gonna lose my money yeah. my paycheck won't come through and it's like you, the the story suffers and yeah. the character suffers yeah. you know there's a good character there she just wasn't given a proper chance yeah. that said the fan base's reaction to her is completely unjustified yeah. and is uh, like not even human it's subhuman yeah. behavior they're treating yeah. the, the, what what they're doing to her yeah. that ain't right but like. Like, the o- Ocean's 8 didn't need to be an Ocean's film. It could just be a film that's just really tightly written. The The brilliant thing is, okay, so, like, I hate and love him. I have a love-hate relationship with Sir Ridley Scott. Mm-hmm. I am of the belief that Ridley Scott is, in fact, not a very good filmmaker, but every film he need, he makes, you have to give it at least 10 years. Mm-hmm. And then you go, okay, he's mm-hmm. actually pretty good. Like um, Kingdom of Heaven, it's actually really great. Yeah, and I think, like, <laughs> American Gangster was yeah. pretty good. It just needed that airtime. Yeah. Um the Alien franchise, I don't know what the hell is going on there, but... There are, Alien- really two, there are two really great films and the rest of them are shit. Yeah, the rest Most, are like... But, but I do like Prometheus. Prometheus, like Batman, Superman, boasted some interesting stuff and then just got kind of lost. Yeah. Because, like, again, like, well, two things. So Tarantino very famously said, like, I love that film, but I kind of, like, love it for a bunch of silly reasons. Like... People get to that planet and then they suddenly become really stupid. Exactly. For like scientists yeah. that are like chosen because they're the best in yeah. the field. Who goes up to a little worm and go, hello, hi yeah. there. So that's Tarantino yeah. literally did that on a video. He's like, that was the dumbest thing. But Ridley Scott writing Alien was really clever because he didn't assign any really outlying character traits to the characters Mm -hmm. like he gave them personality and he gave them archetypes but Mm -hmm. he did not say this character is a woman this character is a man Mm -hmm. he just casts it according to however Mm -hmm. he wanted Mm -hmm. and so many ways and this is potentially kind of iffy and controversial ripley ellen ripley is such a great character Mm -hmm. because she was not written to be a woman yeah she was just written to be a competent survivalist character and she just happened to be cast as a woman yeah so I think that's the thing too. Like, if you're to go back to the Last Jedi, if you write these characters, you can just cast an Asian person that way. Mm-hmm. I, I, for all I know, Ryan Johnson wrote Rose Tico and then was told you have to cast one of these people as an Asian. Yeah. Maybe, but like, the thing is, Ellen Ripley is so pervasive and loved, right? Because like, of her personality and her character traits, and they were those were written. Her mm-hmm. gender wasn't. Mm-hmm. Like, if you really, like, because, you know, a lot of male screenwriters suck at writing women, mm-hmm. well, write your characters genderless mm-hmm. and see what happens. If they're yeah. functional to the story, maybe it'll work. Yeah. Maybe not. I mean, it depends on the story. Mm-hmm. But, like, things like that. Like, don't write them to be a specific race. Don't mm-hmm. write them to be a specific mm-hmm. gender. Mm-hmm. Only time that would have to work is if these are characters that exist from something else. Yeah. Because, obviously, you get the, uh, the ancient one kind yeah. of situation. So... I mean, yeah, that's my my thing. Like, if that's the we were talking about adaptations and remakes mm-hmm. last time I was here. Like, that's the big issue, you know, with adaptations. That's the only time where you have to go. Okay, I really have to respect mm-hmm. the character that I'm adapting. I can't divorce myself too much from who they are, their gender. I can maybe mess around with that a little bit, but there's some things I can't forfeit. But if you're coming up with characters and you have that playground to play with, <laughs> that sandbox, I think, I think, uh, you know, uh, with the diversity thing, uh-huh. right? Uh, the ethnicity and the uh, sexuality of the of characters. I think if the ethnicity or the religion or the sexuality is an important part of the character, you can't change that. Oh, of course. But if that isn't, then changing it is fine. For like, let's take an example. Heimdall. Nobody gave a shit about like Heimdall being like uh, Idris Elba. We know Heimdall as a character because of Idris Elba playing that character, right? Yeah. 
And I think the ancient one was fine for me too. Because the character wasn't... It, this guy is very Asian. It wasn't like that. I mean, the character is Asian in the comics, but it's not... You know, the age being Asian wasn't the more, you know, the defining core, trait, defining trait yeah. of the character. So, you know, they established in, in the Marvel un, in cin, Cinematic Universe that Ancient One is kind of like a title. Like, you can change it. The, the, just this version of uh, Ancient One is this 300-year-old Celtic woman who is actually, who is turns, uh, till played by Tilda Swinton. And that's fine. But let's just take, I don't know, like Captain America, Steve Rogers, and turning him into a black man from this, like, you know, that would be a problem. It's not because we don't want a black character, that would be a problem because you change the character itself. Like, we want a black Superman, and there was a lot of talk about black Michael B. Jordan playing a Superman, and that would be awesome. But he can't play Clark Kent, right? That would be a weird thing, uh, in a way. Maybe. So that is, that, that's the thing, like... You know I was actually I mean? thinking that the the Michael B. Jordan as Clark Kent thing could work, but I think it would be a way. It, well, you can go anyway. You can make it that American idealized white mainstream that Clark yeah. Kent represents, yeah. as in, written by two Jewish guys in the yeah, 40s. exactly. Or you can have the Michael B. Jordan continue with what he really shines at doing, mm-hmm. and that's ca- uh, not catering. That's a very poor choice mm-hmm. of words, but like embodying mm-hmm. the urban black struggle. Yeah, yeah. So Clark Kent becoming Superman. In the face of all of this adversity, yeah. that'd be an interesting take. I think, what was I going to say? Um, like the yeah, if the character is again like race, like gender, all that stuff, you can have those defining traits. Yeah. Like I mean, for all of, like I could write these two characters fall in love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't assign a gender. Mm-hmm. Turns out they're gay. Yeah. Does it, if I have these personality traits being yeah. the dominant things yeah. and their role in the story, yeah. but I know that they're going to fall in love. Yeah. Doesn't matter what gender yeah. they yeah. are, right? I think if I have a very prominent social commentary I need to make, yeah. then it becomes a little more pressing because yeah. it's like, well, okay, then I have to start building up once yeah. I've decided on things like gender. Like, I have to decide the background, yeah. the context. But, like, I think if you start, and I think Alien only works because it's such a simplistic story, too. Yeah. It's the, like, the Agatha Christie, Ten Little Indians. Like, they're getting knocked off one at a time. It really yeah. doesn't matter the order. Yeah. You know, like... Uh, you know, it just doesn't doesn't matter. So yeah. it's like as long as the characters are just archetypal, yeah, and they each represent different parts, yeah. then it's fine. Um, so again, you know, the 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 Ridley Scott way of writing very vaguely has its limitations as well. But I just think that, yeah, there's no, I just I don't think we live in a world where it's like you are limited to things like that anymore. Because mm-hmm. I mean, like Miles Morales, for example. Mm-hmm. Like 2017, oh no, 2018 was a really mm-hmm. good year for him. Yeah. Because he became a really prominent popular character in the uh, Insomniac Spider-Man game mm-hmm. for the PlayStation 4. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that game, game was super popular. And then, um, and then Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse really made yeah. him popular too. Yeah. But when he came out in the comics, like everybody hated him. Mm-hmm. Because, again, they were accusing him of like, oh, you know, you're just... There's not enough diversity in your yeah. comic character, so you're just, so you're just making a character. For, yeah. It's not even pushing an agenda. Yeah. It's just like, well, we're wondering, like, is there any sincerity to the character? Mm-hmm. Is he really, does he have depth? Mm-hmm. Or is it just you cobble together something who happens mm-hmm. and he happens to be half Hispanic, half mm-hmm. black? Mm-hmm. It's like, we're wondering about that. Mm-hmm. That said, I think his, uh, uh, um, his reception has blossomed a bit better than Kamala something, who is Iron. Kamala Khan, right? Yes. Kamala Khan. Uh, she's Iron Man, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, but like, I mean, if you think about it too, like Captain Marvel was like a Muslim woman, right? Yeah, it was a run. No, no, that's, is it? Is it Kamala? Kamala Khan is Captain Marvel. Oh now. no, Miss Marvel. She's yeah. Miss Marvel, right? But there is an Iron Man that's like a yeah. Black that woman. that I think her name is Riri or something. Yeah, Riri, Riri Williams. There Riri go. Williams. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So, like, you know, like, Riri's response has been pretty negative, but Kamala Khan's response has been pretty good, and Miles Morales has got better over time. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's like, you know, if you're going to get all uppity with Brie Larson, I'm not going to go anywhere near that issue either. Like, I will say this. If we're going to push for the encouragement of women to pursue their dreams, mm-hmm. which is I'm 150 million percent for, that's mm-hmm. great. Like, well, is there any harm in maybe not... Just going for the Muslim woman, Captain mm-hmm. Marvel. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe we could have done a twofer. We could have not only really pushed the agenda of mm-hmm. that, but we could have also said, bam, look at that. We mm-hmm. got 
a Muslim woman and she is the key to everything. She is, you know, like that's that talk about a peaceful world, right? Mm-hmm. Like, no, you know, in, this, in the, our Marvel Cinematic Universe, nobody's got any problem with that. Mm-hmm. Nor should you, mm-hmm. right? Don't talk about some very uplifting coding, right? Mm-hmm. So but I think I think so. It's like that Disney is kind of guilty of that. They 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 take those chances, but they're very measured. Yeah. So yeah, we'll do Captain Marvel, but we'll make it a white woman. Yeah. I mean Brie Larson. I will say this: like her, I, she just wasn't the most eloquent in how she presented her argument. Yeah. But I think basically what she's also saying is I'm thankful for the opportunity, but there's probably other minority actresses mm-hmm. that you could have given this role to. The thing about her is that she, I I, I just think she's she's not in the wrong. But at the same time, she's just not charismatic. You know what I mean? Like, wait, just as an actress or the character? No, 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 no. The actress oh. herself. She's just now. We, I'm watching all those press runs, right, mm-hmm. with the uh, end game and everything. She is just so serious about all those things. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you just gotta like let loose some of those things. I mean, I understand you're trying to, you know, uh, you're fighting for equality. You're fighting for representation. Right, everything. Right, right. Everyone is. Everyone in the right are doing that, more or less. Yeah. But sometimes you have to understand that you're playing in a character that is super powered and fighting aliens in space, yes. too. Yes. Like, too, right? I mean, you have to balance those things. And then uh, Chris Hemsworth just made a joke about her doing her, the stunts, uh-huh. right? And it was uh, during a press run. So uh, she said she did all most of her stunts because she thought everyone else was doing the same anyway. So she did most of her stunts. And then Chris Hemsworth just has a friendly jab at her, right? Like she's like, oh, you're trying to be the next Tom Cruise. Like then she gets also serious. Like the whole room gets quiet. She says like, no, what's wrong with me being the first me? Thank you very much. Like that was just. So unnecessary. Yeah, it's hard. Like, it's not like Chris Hemsworth is playing her down, like, you know, misogynistic or whatever way. It was just a friendly jab. Uh, and everybody in the world knows Tom Cruise do, does his, every, you know, crazy stunts. It's not yeah. because he's a man. It's because he's Tom Cruise. And he just happens to be known for doing that. Yeah. And that that was just a friendly jab. She could have played it off, you know, in a playful way. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, because not, every- not, just- yeah, not everyone knows Cynthia Rothrock. Do you know who she is? No, okay, no, I don't. So she's, uh, <laughs> she was on par to be the America's female Jean Claude Van Damme. Okay. So she is like, like fifth Dan degree black belt in okay. like Taekwondo and like all these martial arts. Okay. And she, throughout the 80s and 90s, did a lot of like B action films. Okay. And she did her own stunts. Okay. And she was just known for being really good at it. Okay. And it's like she's this white chick. She's like mm-hmm. a redhead from like California. Mm-hmm. And she's just doing all her this okay. shit. Like it's incredible. Yeah. And that's just, you know, like she had a she had a very prominent audience amongst like martial arts mm-hmm. fans mm-hmm. growing up mm-hmm. in the time. But like nobody fucking knows who she is. She's retired. Yeah. She like races horses or some shit. Mm-hmm. Like, like you know what I mean? Like nobody knows who she is. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, everybody knows who Tom Cruise is. But it does raise an interesting question though, yeah. that there is no woman Tom Cruise equivalent. Yeah. Not yeah. yet. But I, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the world we live in is a very complicated one. I, will I think that. also we forget that Tom Cruise started his acting in a lot of in a wholly different way. Oh yeah, yeah. He wasn't this action superstar from no. the start. No, you know, what I mean? he's an Oscar nominated actor. He's, yes. he's totally different start. Yeah, so oh, that's yeah. he. The stunt doing thing is second nature to him. It's. Not the first thing. The first thing well, is it's like his, that like, it's like his second wind, like Liam Neeson doing his. Well, he does less intense. Yeah, Liam, Neeson, Liam, Liam Neeson's action career. Yeah, is like his second wind. Yeah, following exactly. the death of his wife, he kind of needed to preoccupy himself, so he yeah. did more action films. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, this is a second career win yeah. for Tom Cruise. That's mm-hmm. all. Yeah, like if you really pushed hard enough, you, you could probably whip out another Magnolia level. Mm-hmm level yeah. performance yeah. in a dramatic capacity but it's like you know he just he's enjoying he's making a lot of money doing this and I think he seems to enjoy and it and he's actually making himself. good films too so, so yeah those Mission Impossible ones are great I think uh, Steve McQuarrie Chris Christopher Ru- McQuarrie Chris, Chris McQuarrie uh, is doing a pretty good job with those now they're filming 7 and 8 back to back that's, that's awesome <laughs> I wish he goes to space literally did yeah, you, right. Uh, did, I mean, did I tell you about this exactly. story with James Cameron and Tom Cruise about going to space? No. Okay, so this is this this is there's this super weird uh, interview, right, mm-hmm. with James Cameron. So I'm kind of paraphrasing here. So he said, 
In the early 2000s, he had a deal with the Russian government to film a space documentary, a 3D space documentary actually in space, uh-huh. film it in actual space, right? Uh-huh. So that in itself is weird. And also, he had that deal and he wanted to make a movie using that opportunity to go to actual, actually go to space and film. He wanted to use that opportunity to make another film mm-hmm or at least the scene of a film in space. Mm -hmm. So he called Tom Cruise, Mm -hmm. right? So he called Tom Cruise that I have this deal. Um, I I might be going to actually go into space and film a documentary. And I want to make a film that's actually filmed in space. Are you interested? And Tom Cruise's answer was, yes, I will learn some engineering. (laughs) Let's do that. I will do that. I will learn the engineering stuff. Let's do it. Wow. <laughs> that was Tom Cruise's answer. And that didn't happen because his deal with the Russian government fell off, apparently. <laughs> that That is just... <laughs> so you're going <laughs> to... Tom you're... Cruise is just an interesting guy. What a crazy guy. <laughs> Fascinating dude. I mean, by all accounts, he's a really nice person in to work with. Yeah, yeah. I think his personal beliefs are his business. But, um, you know, I think he's pretty professional. He's a pretty consummate professional, but he's, and he's a good guy to work with. But, wow, okay. Yeah. James Cameron, though, is also a little wild. Yeah, he is. I mean, he, is. He, is he, he really is, like, well, he and George Lucas are about the same age. So, I, mean, I think he's just maybe a little shy of 10 years younger than George Lucas. <laughs> but um, they're, they're about the same camp of, like, yeah. pioneering. Yeah. The only difference is George Lucas's films aren't, like, too early. Yeah. James Cameron somehow manages to get the timing just right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, in terms of the actual physical technological advances for filmmaking, like the two of them are probably neck and neck for yeah. the contributions they've made. But hot damn, I will be remiss if I said George Lucas was not this terribly, horribly timed genius in his own right. The guy was on Game of Thrones set. I don't know what he was doing. Yeah, he was. He was. <laughs> um, and I know that Lucas consulted him. One of the early script ideas he had that uh, Kennedy basically through through uh, gritted teeth through mm-hmm. a fake smile mm-hmm. like said oh thank you George we'll use yeah. them and then did it was like the Jedi temple that Luke was hanging at and yeah. training in his seclusion yeah. was a giant boulder uh-huh. and so he's sitting underneath this giant boulder and he's keeping it from crushing him by using the force and I was like just aesthetically that's a cool yeah visual, that would be nice and I was like why did they use that <laughs> that would have been really cool mm-hmm. um but I mean, you know, there's whatever. It's it's neither here nor there. But apparently, Lucas came back and they talked about stuff. But I don't think he... I don't think Lucas is a great filmmaker, though. No, he's not. Yeah. He, he's just, he's just <laughs> that's what I mean. He's a visionary, and he yeah. knows what the trends are and what he should invest his money yeah. in. But when he actually does it, it's off. Yeah. I would say his earliest films are his better stuff. Yeah. HX, American yeah. Graffiti. Prior to Star Wars. Well, yeah, even Star Wars is not like, you know, that's just such a behind the scenes, you know, it's such yeah. a complex situation. Yeah. How much of it really was him. Yeah. Yep. Especially um, the sequels are just, yeah. Well, in the sequels, the direction, right, was handed off to different yeah. people. Yeah. So you have this kind of situation where it's like, well, how much of it was really him? Yeah. And I know last time when I was here, I was talking about how like the sequel trilogy it seems like there's no clear overarching story mm-hmm. line. It's kind of, I was thinking about it, and I'm not even sure if that's the case with the original trilogy either. Yeah, you know, you like about? clearly Leia and Luke did not, that was not a thing that he thought about from the yeah, beginning. Yeah, at first. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't think Luke and Vader having a relationship, a uh, f- uh, father something was something he thought about right yeah. away. Yeah. But it's just something about the overarching thing, it just kind of works because yeah. I think, you know, Lucas really respected mm-hmm. that cycle Mm -hmm. a campbellian like hero arc Mm -hmm. you know you have to have every character needs to have their own little arc Mm -hmm. you know and it's like real life we're all the main characters of our own stories but the interactions we have with other people there are supporting characters or tertiary characters they all are the stars of their own story and they're all developing and interacting with us and we're creating stories like that like lucas's original star wars trilogy kind of worked in that capacity Mm -hmm. and i think sequel trilogy maybe loses sight of how important that is that's all Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, it's just storytelling is just a complicated, complicated thing. And it's just we've reached that point again where it's just like, what what more can we tell? How do we tell it? Do we innovate? Is storytelling worth innovating mm-hmm. beyond just the technicals, mm-hmm. the visual stuff? Mm-hmm. That's all. I have no idea. 
<laughs> so um I think our time is up. All it's right. uh, it's over. It's been over an oh, oh, hour, 45 minutes. So um, I think we had a really good conversation, right? I, I think, think so. Despite the, the uh, by our own admission, the lack of a clear agenda, I think yeah, we got I think, around. I think okay. the conversation guided itself pretty well. I, I think. think so. Yeah. I think so. Is there anything that you wanted to say or left to say? Like, um, that you couldn't, uh, couldn't or? No, I just, I'm going to keep writing. I encourage anybody that wants to, to do the same. If they have, again, I said this last time too. Mm-hmm. If you're passionate about something, mm-hmm. like really pursue it. Learn everything you can about it. Learn what works, learn what doesn't, learn what, learn what works for you. Practice what your doesn't. craft. Exactly. And the thing is like, it's cool because if you can get to that level and obviously, you know, I'm not there. But, like, it makes com- conversation with people, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. very interesting. You yeah. learn different perspectives. You kind of learn, oh, I can apply this. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. If, I don't know. My time, my, the days are numbered. <laughs> I We could talk about anime before I leave or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe before you leave, we could uh, do another one where, where we talk about we'll something see. else, you know. We'll so we basically talked about a lot of uh, uh, mainstream movies and uh, storytelling, screenwriting, a lot of interesting things uh, that we usually don't talk about mm-hmm. in our, on our other um, podcast in Mongolian. Yeah, that was what I was hoping yeah. we could do. I was yeah. thinking, you know, not to... This is your show, but I was trying to come at it from a. Well, let's see if we can talk about this. Yeah, I wonder how technical we can get. But. Yeah, so that that was great, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and no uh, very uh, challenging to me too to do a podcast in English too. So yeah, so I think uh, it was a great conversation. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank, thank you for, for joining us. Again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, let's hope we can do another podcast before. We'll I leave. see. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll see about we'll, that. We'll look at our we'll look at our calendars and see what we got. Yeah, see what we got. So uh, thank you for uh, thank thanks to everyone who tuned in for this special English podcast, and uh, see you next time with uh, our other podcasts. And uh, bye.